Hi, it's Chris Croft here again from SuccessfulTrainers.com and I want to talk to you today about how you can sell training more effectively. So when you go to see a customer, but also when you're writing a proposal for a customer, I think a diagram is a really great thing. If you can somehow make the content of your training course into a diagram, it's much more memorable for the customer, it's much more attractive. So I want to show you four diagrams that I use. I'm going to go through them really quickly. And in fact, I might do them quite quickly with a customer in the same sort of way, because you want to tantalize the customer and not tell them everything. So, for example, if a customer said to me, um, tell me about your customer service course, what sort of things would you teach them? I would say, well, one of my favorite models when I'm talking about customer service is this. Because there's the core of what you do, and that's obviously great. You have quality control, you produce a great product or a great service. But actually, you're not judged on that. You're judged on the basics, which are things like, um, do you get the customer's name right? Do you phone them back straight away? Are there typos in your proposal? All that really small stuff that they don't notice if it's right, but they really notice if it's wrong. And then there's the delight category on the top there. So do you delight your customer? Do you do things that they're not expecting that is so good that they then remember you and they recommend you to other people and they're really keen to get more business with you? So what do you do to delight your customer? So that's the first model that I like to show people. And I find when I show them that they start to worry about the basics and they think, oh, you know, maybe we're not perfect at the basics. And they really worry about the delight. And they think, well, I can't actually really think of anything much that we do that delights our customers. So that model gets them thinking about it and they think we need to get this guy in. He can help us. So that's what I show for customer care. Now, if I'm talking about time management, I say one of the many things we'll do on the day is the five options for getting more done. And there are only five options. So you've got stuff coming in and being done, but how can you get more done? How can you cope if you've got too much coming in and not enough being done? And there are only five options. And I go through these really quickly with the customer. I say, first of all, you can stop it coming in. So you've got saying no. Secondly, there's a partial no. You can negotiate over how much comes in. You can negotiate over when you do stuff. You can negotiate over um, how long you spend on it. You can negotiate to do part of it or get paid for it or whatever. You can also say yes to it and let it in and then give it to somebody else, which is delegating. That's a great option. Um, or if you can't say no or negotiate and there's nobody else to give it to, you have to do it. You can get more done by either having better systems or by doing it less well, being less fussy, which some people have a problem with. But actually, if you're a complete perfectionist, it can lead to all sorts of difficulties. And by the way, there is a sixth option, which you must never take, which is to say yes and let it in and then not do it. And we'll talk about that on the day as well, because you can never have people not keeping their promises. That's absolutely terrible for customers. So I show them this really quickly and they love it. They're fascinated by it. They want to know more. They want to know about the details, which one to use, when and all of that. And I say, well, if we do the course, we will explore this amongst many other models on the day. So face to face with a customer, that's a great thing to show them. But also when you send your proposal, you can talk about the five uh, options and you can even put that diagram in your proposal because customers remember diagrams much better than big paragraphs of waffle or even bullet point lists. Now, the third theory I want to show you is to do with sales. When I'm doing um, talking about doing a sales course, I talk about the sales tightrope. And I tell them that actually I've got several other sales models that I would use as well. But initially, it's a bit like walking across a tightrope. You start here and you want to finish over here. This is where the sale is. Uh, and sometimes I draw a bag of money there because you, know, you want to get the sale and exchange your excellent service or product for payment. But on the way, there are various ways you can fall off this tightrope. So things like being late for a meeting or um, not, um, not building up rapport with the customer if they don't like you. And we, we would all agree, I'm sure, that we've, we've in the past wanted to buy something, but we didn't buy it because we just didn't like the person, didn't like the salesman or lady. 
So failure to build rapport, um, objections not discovered. So sometimes they just say, well, I don't want to buy it. I, I don't know. I want to think about it. There's some objection which you don't find out. If you can't find out what the objection is, then you can't handle it. And it might be something very easily handled. They might worry that you're only a small company or that you're not based locally or something like that. And there might be a great answer to that objection. Two other reasons why you might fall off the tightrope. It might be uh, that you didn't close. So that you, know, you might uh, present what you do and then just say, well, anyway, there it is. And uh, give us a call if you're interested. And you never actually said, so would you like to buy this or not? And failure to close is quite a common reason why salespeople don't get the deal, amazingly. So that's something we would look at on my course. Um, and there's finally not following up. Failure to follow up. So often salespeople send a proposal and that's it. And they don't want to follow up, of course, because they're worried about getting a no. But quite often, if you follow up, you could change a maybe into a yes, because there may be some objection or they may be just seeing whether you're keen. And if you don't follow up, they think, well, pff, he or she wasn't even interested. They didn't even call me back. So failure to follow up makes the customer look as if you don't care. So I show this tightrope and I explain that these are easy steps to get right. But if you get just one wrong, you're off the tightrope and you never get to the end. So the key is for the salespeople to know what all the pitfalls are and to make sure they don't make any of them. And that's what we'll cover on the day. And you can see how a customer would think, oh, I need to know about those, because what if there's one of those pitfalls that I don't know about? And what if I fall off the tightrope? That'd be bad. So that's the model I use when I'm talking to a customer about selling. Again, I do it on the day and I draw it. I don't just talk about it, I draw it. And then in my proposal, I send a picture of it. I wanna quickly show you one more visual model. I love showing these things and it just really shows you the kind of thing we could use. And obviously, if I help you to become a trainer, I can teach you this sort of stuff. Um, if a customer wants something to do with leadership or management, I say to them, well, there's quite a few interesting models. I'm just gonna show you one because it's all I've got time for. And I show them a thing called the Freedom Ladder. Now, I got this from a book called Managing Management Time by Bill Unken. He's the guy who invented the concept of don't take the monkey when he's talking about delegating and your staff giving you work. So William Unken is great. It's a great book. But I find that most people haven't seen this model. So when I show it to a customer, they're always fascinated by it. There are five levels of freedom or trust with the people who work for you. So at the very bottom, you've just got wait until told. So these people who just sit there and they do nothing till you give them a job to do. And then when they finish that job, they just stop again until you notice and give them something else to do. So they're kind of the worst people really, just wait until told. But I bet you've got some people like that. Anyway, the next level up from that is where they ask what next? And they say, I've done that. What would you like me to do now? So at least there's a little bit of initiative there. So those, they're a little bit better, but the next level above that is the people who actually come to you and they suggest. And you could call them check before acting because they come to you and say, I'd like to do this, or I think we should do this next. What do you think? Is that okay? You know, I've been thinking I ought to tidy that area up, or I think we ought to put the price up on this customer. What do you think? So they actually come to you with ideas, but they have to check with you first. So they are definitely a step up from the ask what next people, aren't they? Now, the next level up, you can probably guess, is report afterwards. So these are people who can just do it, but they have to tell you afterwards. Oh, yeah, I tied to that area up, by the way, just so you know. Or just so you know, I went to see that customer and I got a price increase from them or whatever. So report afterwards. Now, at least with these people, they can only go wrong once. So they don't have to check before working overtime at the weekend. So they have to tell you, oh, we worked overtime at the weekend. I hope that's OK. So they can only go wrong by one weekend. It's not too risky, really. Um, and they get much more empowerment because they can just get on and do it. They don't have to look for you. They don't have to waste your time. The job doesn't have to be held up while they're trying to find you. So report afterwards is great if you can trust them. And then the final level is free to act where they just get on with it. They don't even have to come and tell you each time. There's usually a budget or some sort of way of monitoring, but basically they don't have to report every time they do it. They just get on with their work. So this way of thinking about people is really helpful for bosses because they can decide where they want people to be on this. And they can also decide how can they move people up? Because generally we want to get people higher up, at least to here, which is still very safe, but maybe even to here. 
So this is a really useful framework and it gets rid of lots of confusions because sometimes people think their report afterwards when actually they should have checked first. Or sometimes they think they're checking first when actually they can just get on with it. So that's one of the models we would look at on the leadership day. And this little diagram, which I usually draw with arrows going up, and I usually draw it sort of getting bigger as they go up like that, is quite a, a, an interesting, intriguing little model. And I find that if I show managers that, they immediately start thinking, well, Chris is interesting, he's got some knowledge, there's some good theories, but it's practical as well. I could use that. This is the kind of thing we want to know about and that our managers are going to want to know about. And they won't have seen that before. So you want to get something a little bit unusual that they won't have seen before. So there are some ideas of how I would sell a training course to a customer. We're talking about selling customer care, time management, sales and leadership. But I have a diagram in mind for every subject when I go to see a customer. And I find that that's a really good approach. I put the diagram in both the presentation at the time, but also in the proposal afterwards. Now, if you want to know more about all this kind of stuff, if you want to become a successful trainer or a more successful trainer than you already are, then that's what I'm helping people with. I'm working with a small number of people. I'm coaching them one to one. It's actually me doing the coaching one to one. You get access to me as often as you like. And if you think that would be beneficial, then give me a call on the number below. There's a link below this email where you can call me. And if I can help you, I would love to. It's completely free. It's an exploratory call. So why would you not give me a ring and maybe I can help you? So I hope that's been useful. Even if you don't ring me, I hope it's given you some things to think about and I'll see you in the next video.